Hello and welcome back to the recap. Today we find ourselves in the town of Silent Hill, so strap in and prepare yourselves for this foggy nightmare fueled ride. Be advised of heavy spoilers and be sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the content. Let's get started. The game begins with your character, a novel writer named Harold Mason, driving with his daughter Cheryl down a winding road. A police officer on a bike takes the lead from you and not long after, you notice the same bike crashed on the side of the road. As you turn your head to make sense of it, a girl steps in front of your speeding vehicle. You do all you can to avoid her, so you swirl and crash, losing consciousness. Sometime later, you wake up at the wheel. It seems you're fine, but your daughter Cheryl is missing, and the place you're in doesn't seem to be the same spot you crashed at. Everything is shrouded in fog, and you can barely see the distance. The whole place is like a ghost town, with no one in sight. You hear footsteps slicing through the deafening silence, and they lead you to a distant outline of what appears to be Cheryl. Cheryl? Is that Cheryl? You call for her, but to no avail. She just runs further into the mist. You follow her into a tight alleyway and are met with a splattered corpse of what seems to be an animal. You decide to pursue her further and things start to get bleak. An intense darkness shrouds the town to the point where you have to turn on your lighter just to see what's in front of your nose. Strange sounds unnerve your senses as you stumble upon out-of-place objects like a wheelchair with creaking wheels and a hospital bed with a bloody corpse covered by a sheet. The whole walk feels like a descent into an irreversible nightmare, but all the more reason to keep going and get your daughter. For the grand finale, you start seeing liters of blood and human body parts on the floor, leading up to a flayed and gutted crucified human on a barbed fence. As you turn back, your way is blocked by demon-looking children with knives who appear to kill you. You wake up yet again in a diner, seriously confused, not sure if you were dreaming. You are now met with a police officer named Sybil Bennett from the next town over. The very police officer whose bike you saw crashed on the side of the road. She tells you that all the phones and radios are dead, and the only other person she saw is you. You, on the other hand, explain that you're just a tourist who was on his way to Sound Hill for a vacation with his daughter, who is now missing. Sybil, however, warns you not to go outside because of the possible danger. With that being the case, all the more reason for you to find Cheryl ASAP, so Sybil entrusts you with a weapon for self-defense before leaving for backup and help. You pick up a map of the town from the counter, and as you try to leave, a small radio on the table starts emitting a sort of static-like ringing noise. What's that? You go and check it out, only to be ambushed by a flying skinless creature that bursts through the window. You instinctively fill it with bullets and are met with a horrifying realization that none of that alley business was a dream. This is happening. Anyway, you pick up the radio just in case and with a gun at your side, your best bet is to revisit that alley again. The point where the darkness consumed it is now sealed off with a page from Cheryl's sketchbook saying, To school. As you go about town, you see it infested with those skinless flying creatures and dogs. Also, in your search for the school, you find that most of the roads are cut off, as if something made giant craters in them, making them impossible to traverse. Things are getting more surreal by the minute. On one of the roadblocks, you find more pages from Cheryl's sketchbook, pointing you in the right direction. With a bit of wit, you are able to bypass the roadblocks by going through someone's house. As you step in the backyard, absolute darkness devours the town again, and the feeling of dread intensifies. With a bit of map consulting, you are now able to get to the Midwich Elementary School. It may not be apparent from the get-go, but this school, just like every other major location in the game, has its critical meaning, which will be unveiled along the way. Anyway, as you enter, you see it also abandoned, much like all the houses. You find three cryptic memos written in blood. There is also a sickening painting of hanged people and a door in the reception area. Something doesn't feel right about this school from the get-go. I mean, no shit it doesn't feel right, nothing feels right about this town. It feels as if someone is pushing their religious agenda through. You exit to the courtyard to find an interesting clock tower with sealed doors, and out of the darkness, those demonic children with worm-like heads appear. This time, thankfully, you're somewhat prepared, so you fill them with lead. With not much to do, you decide to decipher the cryptic messages, and this is where you encounter your first real puzzles. 
This also sets the stage for the way you progress in the game. Sound Hill puzzles may not appear logical at first, however, their beauty lies in their symbolism and the reason they're there in the first place, but we'll get to that in due time. You scour the school for clues and fight your way through the demon children until finally you're left with two medallions that seem to fit the slots on the clock tower. One reads Golden Sun and the other Silver Moon. You open the doors and take a leap of fate down a narrow ladder leading into a small underground hallway. It feels super claustrophobic and you start hearing the wailing of that same emergency siren you heard back at the alley. At the end of the hallway is a ladder up, the same as the one you came down with. It feels almost mirrored. You climb it and exit the clock tower only to end up in the same courtyard you came from. Or did you? Everything feels even worse. There is a giant cult-like sign painted on the floor and doors that used to be locked are now unlocked and vice versa. This is where the true horror begins. It feels like that nightmarish alley all over again. Like hell itself devoured the world. You enter the school to find the floors being a metal grid with pitch black abyss under it. Everything feels like an industrial nightmare with rust and blood smeared all over. It's quite obvious now that there is some serious paranormal tripping going on and you're stuck in the middle of it. Every step through this sickening twisted abomination of a dreamlike state holds too much weight, but there's nowhere and nothing to turn back to so you proceed on. You enter the reception again and are met with a real physical recreation of that sickening painting you saw earlier. You slide the card you found into the doors and they open. You are now able to enter the west corridor where you find a somewhat crucified rotting corpse hooked on a multiple IVs in the boys restroom. It's quite sick but important. There's a message in blood saying Leonard Ryan, the monster lurks. Again, all this will be revealed in due time, so if you haven't played Silent Hill, you can enjoy this recap as a journey the game would put you through. As you enter the teacher's room, you find a bunch of phones laid on the table. On further inspection, you find they obviously don't work, so you're out of there, but just as you try to exit, one of them starts ringing. You slowly pick up, and sure enough, there's Cheryl's voice crying out for help. Cheryl! The line goes dead and you go back to exploring this absolute nightmare. In the library you find another sickening sight of more hanged bodies and a book on the shelf titled The Monster Lurks, just like it was written next to the crucified body. This is quite an important clue for the whole story because it explains so much, you just can't tie things together yet. The book is open at a chapter called Manifestation of Delusions. It talks about how negative emotions like fear, worry or stress, if built up enough, can manifest into external energy with physical effects. It also goes about how adolescents, especially girls, are prone to such occurrences. With that in mind, you stumble upon another book on the table, an old fairy tale you remember from when you were a kid. It talks about a hunter having a standoff with a lizard who threatens to swallow him whole. But the hunter shoots into the lizard's gaping mouth, thus defeating him. Now, if you played any game or read any book in your life, you know this is foreshadowing something. Anyway, after some fussing about, all the clues lead you into the basement, straight to the boiler room where an elevator takes you under the school into what seems like a hopeless abyss. What you see in front of you is a metal contraption with a chained body in it. the body starts burning up as if it's being ritualistically sacrificed and sure enough the lizard-like monster you've read about in the fairy tale emerges. You get your shit together and bait the monster to try to swallow you. You take your shot and kill it, just like in the story. As soon as the monster falls the wailing siren starts piercing your eardrums again and you fall unconscious. You have a vision of a girl in the boiler room, a girl suspiciously looking like the one that ran out in front of your car in the beginning of the game. She looks your way and gets startled, as if she saw you, then disappears as you wake up. You are now back in the normal school, and the nightmare world seems to have receded somehow. You also hear what seems to be a church bell echoing through the town, and in lack of any direction, you decide to check it out. Again, most of the roads are blocked off, so you manage to find a way through people's backyards and houses until you finally reach this Balkan church. You enter the church and you are met with this creepy Roman village-looking woman who says she's been expecting you. 
She knows you're looking for your daughter, claiming she sees everything. She also says you must follow the path of the hermit concealed by Flauros. Naturally, you're super confused, but she pulls out a pyramid-like object and calls it Flauros, a cage of peace. Supposedly, its purpose is to break through the walls of darkness and counteract the wrath of the underworld. After what you've just been through, you'll take anything that counteracts the wrath of the underworld. This woman seems to want to help you, but everything about her screams malicious intent. Or at least complete lunacy. But then again, define crazy after what you've just witnessed in this town. The woman tells you to hurry up to a hospital because the time is running out. And then she just leaves. At this point, you're left with more questions than before meeting her. Another strange thing she mentioned is that your coming was foretold by Gyromancy, which kind of contradicts this whole Christian theme going on with the church and stuff. Gyromancy is a method of divination, which in itself is occultic and would be considered blasphemy by Christian ways. But anyway, left with this so-called flautus object in your hand, you decide to find the hospital. Since all the roads are blocked off, your only way is over the bridge to another part of town. After more running around and dealing with these pesky flying monsters, you finally find Alchemilla Hospital. Upon entering, the first thing you hear is a gunshot from the room to the left. You go and check it out, only to find a man with a dead flying monster at his feet. He introduces himself as Dr. Michael Kaufman, an employee of the hospital, and seems to be relieved to see another human being. You hope to get some answers out of him, but all he knows is that when he woke up from his nap, the whole place was like this. Everyone seems to have disappeared and creatures that should not exist swarmed the town. You ask him if he has seen Cheryl, to which he has a bleak reply. I'm sorry. But with all those monsters around, I highly doubt that she's... Sorry, I didn't mean to alarm you. Your wife, she's here with you. She died four years ago. Now it's just me and my daughter. This is the first time we learn about Harry's tragedy and that Cheryl is all he's got. Dr. Kaufman says he just can't sit around doing nothing and leaves. Now this guy is quite strict and cocky. He also seemed to have been handling this whole town getting swallowed by jaws of hell situation like a routine appendix procedure. Anyway, you find a map of the hospital and go on exploring the place. At first glance, there's not much to find. However, in one office you do find a red liquid substance with pieces of glass on the floor that seems to have been smashed on purpose. And if there's anything this game taught you, is that things like this may come in handy, so you scoop it up in a plastic bottle. You come by an elevator and start checking the floors. Besides some cockroaches in the basement, the hospital is empty. There are three floors in total, and you thoroughly check all of them. All the doors seem to be locked or jammed with no way forward. Without other option, you decide to leave. But as you return to the elevator, you notice something strange. Suddenly, there's a button for the fourth floor. You reluctantly press it and brace yourself for the worst. As the elevator moves up, you have a vision of that girl from the school basement again, entering some rundown antique shop. It's quite weird and random for now. As the elevator doors open, you are met with a quite unfortunate, familiar sight. You again find yourself in the other world, or the nightmare realm, if you will. Now, if you thought the nightmare school was bad, think again. This shit is an absolute PTSD-inducing experience. I guess that flautus object isn't doing much of its thing. Another fun fact about the fourth floor appearing is that in Japan, hospitals do not have a fourth floor, because the word four is identical to the word death, hence why it's avoided as nobody wants to be hospitalized on a death floor. So when the button appears, it's not only the floor that wasn't there before, but also a floor that mostly shouldn't exist in a hospital, as it's associated with disease and death. Anyway, you move back down to the third floor through the staircase and the atmosphere is somehow even worse than the initial one on the fourth floor. While the nightmare school looked industrial and run down, this is death plus super bloody. Everything is so much more red and corroded and truly feels like hell. Also, the music is super tense and you encounter a new enemy, the nurse. It seems as if she has some sort of parasite attached to her and is moving around like a puppet, trying to cut you. Fortunately, she's not immune to lead, so you take care of her and go on exploring the hospital. Same as school, you're again presented with some puzzles that try to stall your progress, but you still retain some of your sanity so you figure things out, only to be led back into the basement. 
There is only one locked room there, the storage room, which you unlock by scouring this whole hellhole of a hospital in order to find the key. Once you are in, you notice a strange cupboard by the wall. As you push it out of the way, you are presented with a whole new room that isn't even marked on the map. On the floor, you see a grate with some vines over it leading to an underground hallway. You set the fire to the vines and are able to open the grate. Under the basement, you are presented with a long bunker-style hallway and a bunch of rooms. There are two interesting things you stumble upon here. The first one is a videotape, and the second one is the room that feels different from the others. It feels as if someone has been here recently. There is a bed with some IVs hanging by it, some recently used medication, the key to the examination room, and the most important thing, there is a picture of a girl you saw in the boiler room at school, with the name Alessa written over it. Things are starting to add up a bit now. Although you still have no idea what they're about, it seems that this girl is somehow connected to what's going on here. In one of the rooms on the third floor, you stumbled upon a VCR, so you decide to take the tape there. The tape is mostly a static mess, but you manage to pick up some audio cues. It seems to be a nurse talking about a patient's condition. That is, being shocked by a patient's condition, rather. She also mentions skin and something about not telling something. Other than that, not much to go on, but you did find an examination room key, so there's still that. Upon entering, you spot a nurse hiding under the desk, but she seems different from the others. She quickly crawls to you and hugs you, as if you came to save her. She seems human, and like Dr. Kaufman, she is relieved to see another human being. Her name is Lisa Garland, a nurse in the hospital, and also like Kaufman, she woke up to this state of the world. She seems to be in the dark about everything that's been going on. You ask her about your daughter Cheryl, but she says she hasn't seen anyone of that description. She also seems completely oblivious to the underground level of the hospital because the staff has been under strict orders never to enter the basement storage room. As you try to explain about the room with Alessa's picture, the siren starts wailing again and your head feels like it's going to explode, so you pass out. It's... <clears throat> Damn! My head! What's wrong? Harry? Harry, let me help you. Harry? After coming to your senses, you find yourself in the normal hospital. The nightmare has ended once again. The strange woman from the Balkan church, the one who gave you the flowers, comes into the room and introduces herself as Dahlia Gillespie. You demand answers because she obviously knows more than she's letting on to. Instead, she starts some cryptic insanity. She says that you were too late and that, quote unquote, the other church in town is your destination and that only you can stop all this. She also refers to the crest painted all over the town like the one in the nightmare schoolyard. She says it's the mark of Samael and that it must not be completed. She just leaves again after dropping all this info at you. At least she gave you the key to the other church. The key has a label antique shop and you remember that vision from the hospital where you saw what seemed to be that Alessa girl entering some run-down antique shop. You go about town again in order to find it. This part of town introduces some new larger monsters and everything feels even more unsettling. After some floundering about, you find the shop. At first, it looks like a neglected storage space of antiquities, but then you spot a hole in the wall behind the cupboard. As you move it aside, you hear the front door open. You read your weapon, but it's Sybil, the police officer from the beginning of the game. She's alive and shocked you are too. She realizes how insane things are in town and much like yourself, she couldn't leave. You ask her whether she has seen Cheryl, to which she has an interesting response. She did see a girl fitting Cheryl's description heading towards the lake, but when she went after her, the girl vanished. She also realized the place she saw her was an obliterated part of the Bachman Road, which could only mean the girl was floating, walking on thin air. You tell Sybil about your encounter with Dahlia Gillespie and all the twisted things she told you, like the darkness devouring the town and all that. Sybil just shrugs it off as if Dahlia is a junkie, because the town does have a reputation. There was a lot of drug trade between the locals and the tourists, which is a fact important for later. Sybil also mentions how all investigations into it are met with a dead end. Anyway, before entering the hole in the wall, you hesitantly ask her whether she had an experience of slipping into the nightmare realm or the other world, like yourself. You explain it feeling like being there, but not really, sort of like a hallucination. 
Sybil is once again completely oblivious to what you're saying, so you proceed down a narrow corridor leading into a small bunker-like room. Inside, you see a disturbing makeshift altar. On closer inspection, all you find is some leftover powder in a chalice. With not much to go on, you decide to go back and tell Sybil your findings, but at that moment, a flame erupts from the chalice and things go south. What the? Sybil hears some commotion and enters the hall only to find an empty room. As you come to your senses, you find yourself in that hospital room where you found the nurse Lisa Garland. She's sitting in front of you and everything feels dreamlike again. You ask her whether she knows Dahlia Gillespie, to which she reports that Dahlia is kind of famous in town. She also says she heard Dahlia's child died in the fire and Dahlia went crazy after that. You ask Lisa whether she knows what Dahlia meant by the town being devoured by darkness. Surprisingly, Lisa says she thinks she does. She explains how people here were on the quiet side before the town was turned into a tourist resort. Everybody followed some kind of a weird religion, cult stuff and black magic. As the town became a resort and a lot of new people came, everybody clammed up about the occult stuff. She also mentions that certain crucial people in developing the town into a resort died in weird accidents and unexplained circumstances. Namely, the mayor and the detective in charge of busting the drug ring. Things go dark again and you wake up in the altar room where you passed out, but as you can guess, you're in the nightmare realm again. You start to question everything and wonder if this altogether is a bad dream, or are you lying in a coma somewhere with head injuries from the car accidents. Anyhow, you turn on the flashlight and the sight is sickening. More human sacrifices and there's this supposed mark of Samael on the floor again. Sybil mentions she saw Cheryl going to the lake, so that's your next destination. Okay, some sort of picture is starting to form now. What you know so far is that there was some serious occult stuff going on in this town. There was also a ring of heavy drug trafficking and Dahlia Gillespie's daughter died in some sort of a fire. Maybe that scrambled tape you found in the hospital corresponds with that. There was mention of burnt skin. You also know that there's this girl, Alessa, who looks an awful lot like Cheryl, and after finding her picture by the hospital bed, one could only wonder if she's Dahlia's deceased daughter. She did appear ghost-like in every encounter. But aside all that, you're still debating whether all this is even real. You exit the antique shop and the whole town is now engulfed in nightmare. You run around until you reach a mall where some TV screens turn on upon your entry. In between static, you are able to see flashing alternating images of Cheryl, Alessa and this supposed Mark of Samael. It's all accompanied by an audio of Cheryl calling out for you. This is a very strong visual hint about what's actually going on here, but more on that later. You proceed to check the mall. As you ascend to the upper floor, the metal grates snap and you fall to a sort of sand pit where a giant centipede or a caterpillar or the mix of the two emerges. This boss is a giant bug and like everything else in this game has its significance. As you fill it with enough bullets, it just escapes and you're back on the street trying to find your way around. Since you're close to Alchemilla Hospital and in the Nightmare Realm, you get the idea to go check if Lisa is still there in hopes of getting some info on how to get to the lake. Lisa remembers that there are some abandoned waterworks by the Midwich Elementary School and under them is supposedly a tunnel that leads all the way to the lake. As you try to leave, Lisa begs you not to go. She says she can't stand the fear and the loneliness, but when you ask her to come with you, she just says she feels as if she's not supposed to leave the hospital. This also is very important and ties into the final revelation of the story. You promise to come back for her as soon as you find Cheryl. You exit the hospital and even more roads are cut off now. You can't go east or west. The whole layout has changed. It's like some otherworldly force is directing you up a fire escape onto a building in front of you. You reach the roof and the giant moth attacks you. That centipede, caterpillar, larva evolved and is back to finish you off. The hunting rifle does its job and the moth dies. We hear the siren again and wake up in the normal world. I mean, as normal as it gets. You backtrack all the way to Midwich Elementary and find the site Lisa was telling you about. 
There's an entrance leading into the sewers, and in hopes of getting to the other side, you climb down. Aside from some insect slash lizard-like creatures, there's not much down here. After some serious navigation, you manage to pass through to the lakeside. Darkness devours the town again. There is a sign for a bar across the street, so you enter in hopes of getting resupplied, but what you find is a creature trying to kill Dr. Kaufman, so you shoot it off him. The ever cocky Dr. Kaufman doesn't even thank you. Like Sybil and yourself, he also hasn't managed to find a way out of the city. However, he's confident the military search and rescue will come and you'll be home free. He just disregards this whole insanity as a minor inconvenience. After a moment of silence, you ask him if he knows a girl named Alessa, to which he just gives a quiet and sharp negative answer and leaves, like he has somewhere to be or something. You look around the bar and notice Kaufman dropped his wallet as he was fighting the creature. Inside you find a key and a receipt with a number written over it. The number corresponds to a lock on a nearby shop. This is where you start getting fully suspicious of Dr. Kaufman. He must be connected to this. There's a safe under the counter containing what seems to look like a packet of some drug. There's also a ledger on the counter or a diary of some sort talking about package deliveries going through this store. The person writing this also says how he can't back out now because of the consequences and is getting creeped out more and more by the likes of these people. The ledger also mentions Norman's motel as the meeting spot nearby, so you decide to check it out. Lisa did say there was a lot of drug trafficking, so no wonder people were in on it. You find another diary in the motel written by someone afraid for their life. It says how he can't disobey and says that the person he's afraid of is probably linked to the mayor's death. There's also a newspaper that states how a police investigation into drug trafficking is stalled after the appointed narcotics officer dies of sudden heart failure. Now, you also remember how Lisa told you the mayor and his closest associates die under strange circumstances? Well, according to all this, it's tied to drug trafficking, or something more. Anyway, you search around the motel garage and find an interesting item hidden in the gas tank of a motorcycle. A glass vial with a strange liquid in it just like the one that was smashed on the hospital floor earlier. As you grab it, Dr. Michael Kaufman enters and goes full arrogance mode. Give me that! This is the moment where you start feeling pretty sure Kaufman is somehow involved in the drug traffic and maybe even in the state of this town. He just doesn't seem surprised or too phased about any of this. Hell, he only seems angry, like someone messed up his plans. You decide to move on from the motel to check the rest of the lakeside, but midway, the siren goes off, blazing, and the landscape changes into the nightmare realm. Only this time it's different. So far, it felt like you were slipping into a bad dream, but this time, it feels as if the reality itself became a nightmare. You can see the pavement becoming a metal grate, the earth under you becoming an endless abyss, so you start running as fast as you can and hide in a nearby boat. Funny enough, there's Sybil in the cabin. She also followed the sewer tunnels to the lake. You try to explain to her that you think this whole town is being invaded by some sort of other world. Someone's nightmarish delusions coming to life and tearing the veil between dream and reality. Little by little, the invasion is spreading and trying to swallow everything in darkness. You are not certain who is doing this, but you're beginning to understand what Dahlia Gillespie meant. And after this last transition, you're quite sure you're not crazy or delusional either. Sybil has a hard time processing the whole thing, and as she tries to persuade you to take a breather, Dahlia Gillespie enters the cabin. The demon is awakening, spreading those wings! Dahlia Gillespie. Was it not as I said? I see it all now. Yes, everything. Hungry for sacrifice, the demon will swallow up the land. I knew this day would come. And what's more, the task is almost finished. There's only two left. To seal this town to the abyss, the mark of Samael. When it is completed, all is lost. Even in daytime, darkness will cover the sun. The dead will walk and martyrs will burn in the fires of hell. Everyone will die. 
So what am I supposed to do? I've got to save Cheryl. Go to the lighthouse on the lake. And to the center of the amusement park. Make haste. You are the only hope. Look, Harry. I really don't get what's going on. But if there's a chance we can save your daughter, I'm in. I'll check out the amusement park. Maybe that flowers thing finally pays off. Anyway, you're on your way to the lighthouse. Upon reaching the top, you see a glimpse of Alessa standing on a giant mark of Samael painted on the floor, but she quickly disappears. With no new information, your only option is to go to the amusement park to check on Sybil's findings. The only way is yet through another sewer. As you climb down, you see the alleged mark of Samael everywhere, on the floor, etched in the metal grates. It feels as a culmination of something, as if you're reaching some sort of a breaking point. You somehow survive all this insanity and manage to get yourself to the amusement park, but you are presented with more obstacles. You see lifeless Sybil sitting in a wheelchair by the roundabout. As you approach her, she slowly stands up and opens her eyes. They're blood red, demon-like. She starts walking towards you zombie style, as if she is a puppet being controlled by something or someone. Just when you think things can get worse, she pulls out her gun and lets loose on you. Since you have no heart to just straight up shoot her, you take that red liquid you scooped from the hospital floor and throw it at her. Sybil starts contorting and evaporating before she falls to the floor. A strange demonic bug-like creature crawls out of her and you stomp it. Fortunately, Sybil is okay, but she doesn't recollect being controlled by a parasite. She desperately asks why would these people take your daughter, to which you reveal that Cheryl isn't your biological daughter. You found her as a baby on the side of the road. No one knew where she came from or who she was related to. Since you couldn't have kids and your wife was sick, you took her in to brighten your life. But now, it's apparent that there is some connection between Cheryl and this town. Anyway, you are determined to save Cheryl no matter what, so you push forward. But suddenly, Alessa appears in front of you. She pushes you away with telekinesis, but that flowerous object comes levitating out of your pocket, glowing, activating itself. The object weakens Alessa and she falls to the floor. In that moment, Dahlia Gillespie shows up, of course. We meet at last, Alessa. Dahlia Gillespie? Where's Cheryl? Where is she? Alessa. This is the end of your little game. Mama? Okay, so we heard Alessa call her mama, which confirms speculation about Alessa being her daughter. Dahlia was obviously deceiving us this whole time. She needed us to expose Alessa to the flowers because Alessa was hiding from her, and this flowers object obviously has the power to subdue Alessa. Through their conversation, we also understand that Dahlia has something greater and malicious planned for Alessa, so she conjures up some blinding light and you wake up back in the hospital next to Lisa Garland. Lisa looks much worse than the last time you left her. Her eye is twitchy and she's much paler. She also seems more agitated than afraid, as if something inside her is changing. She tells you she'd been to check the basement after your last conversation and she got a strong feeling she'd been there before. A feeling as if something happened down there, but she can't quite recollect what. You try to throw a few words of comfort at her, but she just straight up runs out of the room. A whirling machinery type sound slowly starts creeping from below. Sounds like the basement, so you go and check it. As you exit the room, the hospital looks nothing like it used to. There is a metal grate leading to a single elevator that's slowly opening as if inviting you in, as if you're being summoned to the grand finale. You bravely enter and it takes you way down to what looks like the rest of Alchemila Hospital. But is it? This place is a combination of Midwich Elementary School, Alchemila Hospital and the antique shop. Doors lead to different locations in between rooms, then don't take you back to the room you came from. It feels like everywhere and nowhere at the same time. It feels like you're deep in someone's psyche now, which makes this place riddled with puzzles and symbolism. We're getting to that real soon, but for now, to make matters worse, there's no map for this place. And anyone who's played Silent Hill knows how much you rely on the map. Anyway, you work your way through this rotten, putrid, blood-soaked nightmare until you catch up with Lisa Garland. Harry? 
Lisa, what's the matter with you? I get it now. Why well, I am still alive even though everyone else is dead. I'm not the only one who's still walking around. This is the moment where Lisa fully recollects what she did in the basement. And this is the moment where she understands she's actually dead. She's a ghost or a spirit of sorts. That's why you were only able to see her in the Nightmare Realm. Other characters like Dahlia Kaufman or Sybil were present in the normal realm and would or wouldn't transfer into the Nightmare One. But Lisa is only here. Only in the hospital. That's why she couldn't leave when you asked her. Death and her duty here and soon you'll find out the details. <laughs> Anyway, you lock her behind in the fear for your life and move on, immediately faced with a diary on the floor. The diary that reads, Ask the doctor to let me quit being in charge of the patient. It's too weird. Still alive, but with wounds that won't heal. Told the doctor I quit. Won't work at the hospital anymore. The room is filled with insects. Even with doors and windows shut, they get in to spite me. Feeling bad, need to throw up, but nothing comes out vomiting only bile. Blood and pus flow from the bathroom faucet. I try to stop it, but it won't turn off. Need a drug? Help me. Okay, now this is everything. This is Lisa's diary. This was her life and ultimately implicates her fate. She obviously cared for someone who was horribly burned. We know that Alessa supposedly died in the fire. Also, remember that room with VHS player from the first visit to the hospital? Well, you stumble upon the same room here, but when you insert the tape, now you get the clean feed. What is it? Still has an unusually high fever. Eyes don't open. Getting a pulse, but just barely breathing. Her skin is all charred. Even when I change the bandages, the blood and pus just start oozing through. Why? What is keeping that child alive? I can't stand it any longer. I won't tell a soul. Promise. So please. Now we know the fire thing is true, but there are still more questions than answers, so bear with me for a couple of more minutes and everything will be explained. Sound Hill teases you all the way to the end and then drops a massive load of revelations on you. So you move on through quite the large amount of puzzles until you reach that hidden bunker hallway from the hospital basement. In one of the rooms, you find a memory of Alessa crying under the table. As you light up the room, you see a bunch of doodles scrambled all over the walls, with the most notable one being a cry for help. Looks pretty sick. Across the hall is the room where you first saw Alessa's picture, and as you enter, you are presented with another memory. We see two unnamed persons, Dahlia Gillespie and, of course, Dr. Michael Kaufman standing above Alessa's charred, covered body. Everything is going according to plan. Sheltered in the womb. But it's not done yet. Half the soul is lost. That is why the seed lies dormant. And what soul remains captured in that husk? Is buried deep down in the subconscious. Are you trying to say it won't work? That wasn't our agreement. No, no, these are just stalling tactics. If we lend a hand, we will be able to get power. Never fear, the promise shall not be broken. But the power we could draw now will be very weak. Almost nothing. Unless we get the other half of the soul. We'll use a magical spell. Feeling this child's pain, it's sure to come. But that will take time. And now you have proof none of this is circumstantial. Cheryl is Alessa's other half. The reason there was no record of a baby or any relatives is that Cheryl is just a physical embodiment of Alessa's second half of the soul. 
The whole reason you went to Silent Hill in the first place is because it was Cheryl's wish. She was drawn to this place by her other half. You remember the cult Lisa Garland mentioned? Well, Dahlia Gillespie is their leader and high priestess. This cult, or the Order as they call themselves, believes that they are the one true religion and their goal is to bring forth the apocalypse and deliver the faithful to paradise. Although they do believe in God, soul, sin, heaven and hell, it seems their concept is not based on good and evil but more on chaos and order. Sort of a moral nihilism, which is proved in the way Dahlia treats Alessa and goes about handling things. That's why it resembles occultism and satanic worship at times, accompanied with Christian martyrdom all the way to gyromancy. Anyway, their idea was to birth God into physical existence. To accomplish this, they needed a mortal female for immaculate conception. That female ended up being Alessa Gillespie. Now, keep this sickness in mind. Alessa was only seven years old when they performed a magic ritual to impregnate her with the seed of the god. The important thing is that Alessa was born with certain powers. She was psychic and no ordinary child in the first place, which also is one of the reasons Dahlia chose her. The other reason would be Dahlia's complete power trip and joy of her own daughter being the mother of God and ushering paradise. Dahlia believes that by doing so, she will release humanity from eternal suffering. Now, a thing that's even more disturbing is that the fire that left Alessa burnt beyond reason was not an accident. It was part of the ritual. Alessa was meant to be burned to be weakened so that the incubated god would be able to take over. The Order's problem arose when Alessa, mid-ritual, split her soul in two parts because of the agony she had to endure. This act stalled the completion of the ritual and made the seed lie dormant in her. This also left Alessa in a permanent burnt state. It put her mentally and physically in her own hell, which is now spewing from her subconsciousness into reality. You remember that book from the school that foreshadowed what's actually going on? The book talking about how negative emotions like fear, worry or stress, if built up enough, can manifest into external energy with physical effects, especially through adolescent girls? Well, that is what we are witnessing in this town. Since Dr. Kaufman was a member of the cult and the director of Alchemilla Hospital, he arranged for Alessa to be transferred to the hidden basement unit and he put a nurse in charge of her care. The nurse's name was Lisa Garland. For almost seven years, Lisa took care of a child in a permanent burnt state with wounds that cannot heal. That's what Lisa was talking about on the tape you found and that's what her journal points to. The nightmare started pouring into reality from this very location, and Lisa was the first to witness its effect on town. Dahlia covered the whole thing up by stating there was a boiler malfunction at her house and that her daughter tragically passed away in the fire. Anyway, you move on to the next room to find it being Alessa's old room at her home. There's the dress you always see her in hanging on the wall. There's also a large collection of butterflies and moths, and there are fairy tale books scattered around. Like I said before, there's a reason for the type of every enemy you encounter. You can clearly see Alessa's fascination with insects here, thus the moth boss and all the other insect-like enemies. The skinless dogs, for example, are a part of the world because Alessa was afraid of dogs. Since she was different, her peers picked on her a lot in school. So the little grey children with knives are nothing more than her projection of all the bullies, that is, how her fears manifest them visually. Another very important enemy type to mention are the nurse and the doctors. The reason they move like zombies and have that controlling parasite on their back is because they were controlled by Dr. Kaufman into carrying out his orders, so Alessa sees them as nothing else but his puppets. Now, while we're on the subject of nurses, Lisa Garland, though, is a specific case. She was a young nurse, so she was easily manipulated, especially by someone intimidating like Kaufman. Another circumstance is that Lisa was a drug user. She was a PTD addict, the drug we talked about being distributed to tourists. Dr. Kaufman also used the drug to indoctrinate new cult members, to keep them in the state of trance and acceptance. Lisa probably ended up using the drug the same way, so she was easily blackmailed into being Alessa's caregiver. Lisa Garland is both a victim and an accomplice stuck in her own limbo, which later translates to her death with her not being able to pass on, haunting the hospital as a ghost. The reason she doesn't remember things when you meet her is probably because it's still Alessa's nightmare. Lisa was good-hearted and kind to Alessa, so that's the way we see her in the nightmare, the way Alessa remembers her. That's why Lisa feels out of place in the nightmare and that's why she's protected from the dangers of the nightmare. It is unclear though how she died, whether by overdose, by her own hand or someone else's, but in the end it's the same. She was used and pushed to her breaking point. 
Now you move on through the opposite door to find yourself in the rest of the old burned Gillespie home. You see another memory, this time of Dahlia forcing Alessa to her will and most importantly, the moment she gets the idea to impregnate Alessa. There's nowhere for you to go except down to the core of the nightmare, so you brace yourself and enter the deepest recesses of Alessa's mind. As you climb down, you find Sybil pointing a gun at Dahlia. Next to them is Alessa's charred body and her soul, complete. Dahlia reveals how the mark of Samael you saw, the one she said must not be completed, is actually the seal of Metatron. Alessa was the one inscribing it all over the town in order to stop the birth of their god. It's true that all would be lost if it was completed, but for Dahlia. Now, when I refer to Alessa throughout the whole recap, I mean Alessa's first half of the soul. All your encounters with Alessa in the game are actually with the projection of the first half of the soul. Alessa's physical charred body was stored away at all times. Dahlia also deceived you about another thing, the Flauros. Its purpose is not any kind of protection or repelling the forces of darkness. It was intended to weaken Alessa's projection so Dahlia could take the first half of the soul and complete the ritual. That's why Dahlia said you were the key. You could see Alessa while she couldn't, because Alessa was hiding from her by using her supernatural abilities. The whole reason you were switching between the nightmare and normal realm and all the puzzles implemented in the world are Alessa's attempt to stop you from reaching her before she completes the seal of Metatron. Unfortunately, she failed. Cheryl was with Dahlia all along and when the flowers was used, Dahlia had fused the soul back. Sybil has had enough of this madness so she shoots at Dahlia, but Dahlia is protected by a magic ward and cannot be hurt. Instead, she completes the ritual and fuses Alessa's body with her complete soul resulting in the creation of the Incubator. The Incubator takes the form of a heavenly sight, a holy like glowing female, a mother of God. However, at that moment, Dahlia does get shot, but by the surprise guest of the party, Dr. Michael Kaufman. As always, he's in no mood and has had enough. He pulls out that red liquid bottle you found at the resort in a bike, the same liquid you used to save Sybil. Dahlia is wounded but still alive and goes from cocky to panic mode as she sees it. I love this! I thought I got rid of that! Remember the broken one you found at the hospital? It was Dahlia who broke it, but Kaufman saved some as a failsafe. He knew Dahlia would want to get rid of it by any means because this liquid called aglophatis is extremely rare and hard to obtain and apparently it is made from the herb with the power to dispel evil spirits. Dr. Kaufman wastes no time and throws it at the incubator. But it seems it's too late. It seems to just hasten the birth. Huh? What the? Baphomet looking demon emerges from the incubator's back just like from a cocoon and starts spewing hellish electricity all over the place, murdering Dahlia in the process. Their god is born. In lack of any options, you pull out your hunting rifle and start filling the demon with lead. Fortunately, god's physical form is governed by the laws of physics, so after it eats enough bullets, it goes down and the whole place starts collapsing. The demon disappears and the incubator's glow fades, revealing Alessa's face. She creates a reincarnation of herself in form of a newborn baby and hands it to you. You take the child in your arms and Alessa creates a light for you to follow, freezing the collapsing nightmare with the last of her strength, giving you a chance to escape, so you're out of there along with Sybil. Dr. Kaufman tries to follow, but at that very moment, Lisa Garland emerges and drags him to the depths of hell. Only in her death does she take matters into her own hands, by coming to terms with what she was a part of.
The whole blood-soaking scene with her resembles her transformation from a lost soul into a vengeful spirit seeking justice and finding peace by acting on it. In this case, killing the orchestrator of her nightmare. Alessa fades, she is free. After seven long years of inhumane torment, she can finally rest in peace. And there you have it, the whole story of Silent Hill. For me, one of the best games of all time. Also, this whole explanation is made from the information you receive in the original game. Later in the franchise, we do get more info and backstory on certain characters and events, but this is what you get after you finish this game. Normally, we would end the episode here, but there are a few other things that need mentioning. First one being that there are multiple endings to this game, depending on your choices. This recap was made from a good plus ending perspective, which allows you to get the full picture and should also be canon. But we have to talk about other endings as well. There are four of them in total, including a special one. The endings are good plus, good, bad plus, and bad. They all revolve around a combination of two optional things. In the case of Good Plus ending, you saved Sybil with the remains of Aglophatis and you followed the lead of drug trafficking and saved Dr. Kaufman from that mumbler creature, as well as you find the hidden Aglophatis in the bike. The good ending is presented if you save Kaufman but kill Sybil. The end result is the same, just without Sybil in the mix. The Bad Plus ending is obtained by saving Sybil and disregarding the whole Kaufman side quest. Since Kaufman doesn't appear in the last fight, he also doesn't throw the Aclophatis on the incubator, so she doesn't birth Baphomet. You fight her as she is. When you finally kill her, there is no resolution. You feel as if you killed your own daughter, so you decide to stay in the collapsing nightmare and die, but Sybil snaps you out of it and it is unclear whether you two make it out or not. The bad ending requires you to kill Sybil and disregard the Kaufman side quest. The fight is the same as Bad Plus ending, but the final resolution is that you've simply died in a car crash and all this was a dying dream, your last few moments of brain activity. There's still the special ending, or the UFO ending, as people call it. Now, this ending can only be achieved once you have already beaten the game. On the second playthrough, you find the item called the Channeling Stone, which should be used in specific locations throughout the town. Each time you use it, you will hear a strange sound and see a light in the sky. Once you use it on the final location, the game ends prematurely and aliens land. You politely ask them if they have seen Cheryl, but they just zap and abduct you. The end. This was of course meant as a joke ending. That's it. So as always, stay tuned for the second installment and don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Cheers. Ah!